Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jim Brown, and I'm the happy pastor of the Lake Church. <laughs> Love this church. It's amazing. Thanks for coming out today. Um, I texted my sister Karen, who was here early helping set up, and I said, who ordered the fog? <laughs> so actually, I went home and put on a jacket. It's just a little cooler than I had expected it to be, but I'm glad that you're all here. And I hope you're settled in and got your coffee and stuff. And for those of you who are a little bit on the new side, my average uh, message length is about two hours. <laughs> wink, 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 wink. There's a couple of things I'd like to point out to you if you grab your bulletin before... I don't know what I did with mine, doesn't matter. If you open up your bulletin down to the bottom of the one page, you're going to see three things I want to point out before I get started. One is thelakechurch.org slash 316. It'll say that, I think, on the bottom right-hand corner. And this is basically a landing page that we created. I wrote it up and had our tech whiz put it on. And basically, it's to answer some questions you might have after the message today about how can I, how can I have a relationship with Jesus? And if you're interested in that, if you're wanting to know what that's about, go to that website. There's a second thing I want you to notice at the bottom, and it talks about 40 days of hope. Uh, how many of you feel like the world is a little bit messed up? Okay. And so for those of us who do, hope is what we need. And so I've started a two-minute devotional starting tomorrow morning, number one. And it's going to go Monday through Friday, and I'm calling it 40 days of hope. It takes about two minutes to read or two minutes to listen to me narrate it. And uh, it starts tomorrow. To get that to your email, you can just do it on your phone, your tablet, but you've got to sign up via your email Go again to that 316 site down at the bottom, and you'll find a place you can put your email in there, which is nice. The other thing is our normal meeting location is 10 o'clock, and we meet over at the conference center. How many of you have prayed from time to time? I won't ask for a show of hands on the next one, but I know that people a lot of times pray and kind of feel like, I don't know that it's doing anything. So I'm going to do a short series starting next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock called Prayers That Work. So we'll talk about that. So if that's something you want to know more about, then come and join us. The surveys show that most Americans pray. Most people in the world pray, regardless of what they believe in. Even atheists, percentage of them pray. I don't know how that works. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to talk about prayers that work. Well, this is a special day, of course. It's Easter. And this particular day, I just, I just love this day. I mean, this is like my favorite day of the year for the church. This is more important than Christmas. This is more important than anything else. This is like the Super Bowl. You remember the Super Bowl just a couple of months ago? This is like the Super Bowl or March Madness. <laughs> Aztecs did great. Or like the Grand Slam or the Triple Crown or the World Series. This is like what, this is the final thing. This is the thing that makes it all right, that makes it all make sense. So we're going to talk about that. I call this the event that changed the world. I want you to pause for a minute, though, and I, on Sunday, and I want you to kind of think back to last Sunday. And I want you to think back to about 2,000 years ago when Jesus was actually living his life. Because for Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, to make sense, I have to take you back a week before that to what we call Palm Sunday. And yet Palm Sunday was not called Palm Sunday when Jesus was there. But you have to kind of, it'll, it'll make it all make sense. So on that particular Sunday, Jesus and his followers, they decide, okay, it's time for us to come into Jerusalem. And Jesus and his followers up until that point had been playing cat and mouse with the Jewish temple guard who wanted to arrest him. And you need to know this about the Jews back in that day. Passover was a big, big deal for Jews. And this was the Sunday before Passover. And so Jerusalem went from a town of about 50,000 to maybe, some estimates are, three to 400,000 people. Because if you were a Jew and you lived within a day's walk of Jerusalem, you had to come to Jerusalem in order to do Passover. If you lived further than a day's walk, then you had to come at least once in your lifetime. And so therefore, Jerusalem, that week of Passover, just grew and grew and grew. And so Jesus comes in riding the white colt. He comes in with his guys, his 12 guys, 
And Jesus is greeted like a victorious military general. They're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're just going crazy. He's riding a white colt, Jesus is. They put down their cloaks. They put down palm branches. I want to pause just for a minute. Let's assume you were part of the 12 that day. How would you feel? Have you ever been around someone who's super popular and everyone's shouting for him, but you're one of the insiders? They felt amazing. They felt like, we've won. We've won. Because the crowd, again, is saying, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, which meant, save us now. Save us from the Romans. We Jews hate the Romans. They are putting us under their thumb. We don't like being controlled by them. And we were told, and we're believing that Jesus, he's talking about starting a new kingdom. Wow, Jesus, you're, you're our new king. You're going you're gonna to basically stomp the Romans out of existence, and we Jews will have our freedom again. That's why the crowd went nuts. And again, if you're one of the 12 coming in with Jesus, you've got to be feeling good. Like, yeah, yeah. I know Jesus. I'm one of the 12. And people are probably shaking your hand, high-fiving, or whatever they did back then. So I want you to capture that feeling. That's how they felt. And now I want to move ahead about four days to Passover. And this was a quieter day, and Passover for all Jews, as I said, was really important. And for Jesus, this was important. He was a Jew. His 12 disciples were Jews. And every year of all their lives, they had done Passover, which reminded them, of course, of what Moses had done when he brought the children of Israel, you know, free from Egypt and the Pharaoh. They set us free. They were remembering that every year with Passover. But this year was a little different. They met in an upper room, which was not unusual, and they prepared the Passover feast, which was not unusual. But then after Passover, Jesus did something that was unusual. He started something that we call communion. It hadn't happened before. And i got to remind you that Jesus basically didn't come to reform something that was. He came to start something brand new. And this was one of the things that was brand new, was communion. He broke the bread, and he passed it around to his guys. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And they said, huh? What? Your body isn't, what? What, do you, what are you talking about? And then he passed the cup. And he said, this represents my blood, which is shed for you. And they're going, huh? Now again, remember four days before this, they were victorious and all that. And Jesus is talking almost nonsense. And he talks about being betrayed by one of them. That was Judas and he left. Talks about, to Peter, you're going to deny me. And they're, they're all just scratching their heads. What? This doesn't make any sense. And then they left the upper room and they went over to, get to the garden where Jesus loved to pray in the garden. And they prayed. And later on, as you know the story, Judas and the temple guards and the Romans came with torches. Judas kissed him on the cheek to indicate this is Jesus. And they arrested Jesus, and they took him away. And the disciples are going, what? You can't do that. What? And they took him away. Fear must have struck their hearts. They were kind of going, "Uh, now what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Then they remembered something that Jesus said in the upper room. He said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. And so I can imagine they held on to one another as they watched their Messiah be hauled away by all the guards. He was arrested that night. He was tried at night, which was illegal, a capital offense to be tried at night. But they did. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. I'll have him flogged if that'll take care of it. The Jews said, no, it's not enough. He said, okay, here's Barabbas, here's Jesus. This guy's a murderer. Jesus, I find no fault in him. Who should I release to you? Release unto us Barabbas, the Jews said. What should I do with Jesus? Crucify him, the Jews said. Crucify him. Crucify him. 
And so at about 9 o'clock in the morning, Jesus was hanging on a cross on what we call Good Friday. He was being crucified. Now, you need to understand that the goal of crucifixion back in the ancient times was not to kill a man. There were faster and simpler ways to do that. The goal of crucifixion back in those days was to put terror into everyone who was there, all the Jews, all the people. Don't mess with Rome. And the second thing was to eliminate this person, not just to kill him, but to make it as though he never existed. That was the goal. So who was there at the time? There were the Romans who were doing the crucifixion, and these guys loved their job, and they were very good at it. They knew how to kill someone. There were Jews there who were probably jumping up and down and going, hooray, getting rid of this troublesome rabbi. But there were also confused Galileans who had seen Jesus do miracles and had heard him talk. Maybe it had been part of the 5,000 who got fed. They had seen that, and they were confused, and they were wondering what was, what was going on. And then we have frightened followers. The 12 that came in like royalty on Sunday are now afraid for their lives. If the Romans can capture our leader, then what are we? We're like nothing compared to that. We have to be careful about ourselves as well. We have broken-hearted women who are there. Imagine being Mary, the mother of Jesus, and watching your son be stripped naked and nailed to a cross and crucified. I want you to ponder. You're sitting there at that time. You're watching. You're standing there at that time. How do you feel? Confused? Frightened? Upset? Probably. Can I tell you? I told you who was there. Can I tell you who was not there? Who was not there at the crucifixion? There were no Christians there. There was no church. There were no Bibles. There were no believers. There were no disciples. You see, the key to Jesus' ministry is not what he said, not his teachings. I mean, some of the things he said, again, for his, the things he taught, were to Jews didn't make a lot of sense. Pay your taxes. Pray for those who persecute you. Are you kidding? Forgive no matter what. Are you kidding me? That was what Jesus taught. Very impractical. But Jesus was not killed for what he taught. He was killed for what he said he was, who he said he was. He said he was a king. He said he was the Messiah that had been promised from the Old Testament. Christ is the Greek word for Messiah in the Old Testament, the Savior. He said, Jesus said, that he was greater than Moses. Now that really upset the Jews. The Jews said, you can't be greater than Moses. Moses is the one who gave us the law. He gave us the Torah. He gave us the Ten Commandments. You can't be greater than him. Jesus also said, I'm greater than the prophets. You can't be greater than the prophets that you said. I mean, the prophets were given by God. You can't be greater than, than them. And then this really made them crazy. Jesus said, I'm greater than the temple. One that is greater than the temple is here. That really drove them nuts because for Jews, the temple was the place they went to sacrifice every year to get right with God. They had the whole temple process down to a science. Jesus also told his followers, I have seen Abraham. He told those around him, the, the Sadducees, I have seen Abraham. How could you see Abraham? He was like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And Jesus said this. He said to his guys, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Huh? How, is that, how does that work? And then he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. This is who's hanging on the cross now. And it's really causing great confusion on his followers, as I said. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus finally breathed his last. Crucifixion was not a fast process. It took hours, as it did here. He said, it is finished. And he breathed his last. His followers at that time had to have thought, we're wrong. 
We believed in him. We trusted him. We were wrong. If he truly was the son of God, you can't kill the son of God. If he was truly the Messiah, you can't kill the Messiah. We must have been wrong about everything. They must have also, his followers must have also thought, Jesus has died, therefore Rome has won. And as I said earlier, his followers are now scrambling to figure out how can we protect ourselves? Because everyone there, the Romans, the Jews, the confused Galileans, the followers, ex-followers of Jesus, they all believed the dead Jesus to do what all dead people do, and that is to stay dead. That's what they expected. And again, I remind you, at that point, there were no Christians. There was no church. There was no Bible. There were no believers. There were no followers at that point in history. Now, crucifixion is an interesting thing because I mentioned that they want to kill someone, but then they want to eliminate him as though he had never lived. And one of the ways they do that is they got the corpse down from the, from the cross, and they would throw him actually literally in a garbage place for all the trash and the garbage, and they would let him rot and get eaten by the wild animals. I know it sounds gross, but that's what they did. And let, but there were, was a possibility. In some cases, you could bribe the centurion guards and say, can I have this body? And sometimes they'll let you have it. Enter two interesting guys, Nick and Joe. <laughs> Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. These guys were Pharisees who believed Jesus was the Messiah. They were secret followers of Jesus. And they went, Joseph had a lot of money, apparently. They went to Governor Pilate and said, can we have the body? And I imagine there was some money that changed hands. They came back. They just bypassed the centurions. They came back. They took the corpse of Jesus down. And the sun, as the sun was going down for Sabbath to begin, they hurried to the tomb that Joseph had for his family. He gave it to Jesus and to be buried there. They went with their strips of linen and spices, which is how they buried bodies back in the old days. And then they rolled the stone in front of it. Now, you might want to know that historically, the way this worked was they would put a body in there, they would treat it, and then years later they would come back, open it up, and all that would be left would be the bones. And they would take the bones and they would put it in a box called an ossuary, a bone box. And this ossuary then would be given to a family member uh, to be kept. Nowadays, it's common to keep ashes. Then it was common to keep bones in a bone box. And even with all the, the stuff that's going on over in that area of the world and all the excavation that's happening, there are thousands of bone boxes that have been created with bones they have found during that time. So now again, I want you to pause and remember what there wasn't at this time. No Christians, no church, no Bible, no believers, no followers. Jesus has been put into a tomb and the stone has been rolled in front. Now, I want you to hold there and I want you to go with me 300, 300 years, 350 years, let's say, into the future. From then, that point to 350 years, now it is, three, it is in a specific date. February 27th, 380 A.D. You all familiar with that date? I want to introduce you also to a Roman Empire at the, emperor at the time, Theodosius I, and something that he signed called the Edict of Thessalonica. The Edict of Thessalonica made for the Roman Empire, which was everywhere, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And it also unfunded all of the pagan religions they had going at the time. And if you remember some about Romans, you've got, you've got Jupiter, and you've got Apollo, and you've got Mars, you've got these, these little deities they've made up. It unfunds all of that, and that money now goes to the Christian church. And it's interesting to think about that because Jesus was not Roman. Jesus was not, had not even visited Rome. It's too far away from him. But if you go now to today, 
That was 380. Go down to today, to Rome. And what you have in Rome now is you got crosses everywhere in Rome. They wear them around the neck. They have them on the walls. They have them in their homes. They have them everywhere. And they, but they no longer stand for all the horror of crucifixion. They all represent one crucifixion that took place. And if you go to Jerusalem today, you will find thousands of tourists from all over the world who want to walk where Jesus walked, who want to see what Jesus saw, who want to see the land where he grew up and where he ministered. Now, everything I've shared with you has been historically accurate and verifiable. Everything. If you're a thinking person, you should be asking yourself this question. What happened? What happened between the stone rolling across and Jesus in there wrapped with linen and spices? What happened between then and 380 and today? What happened? Well, what happened is why we're here. What happened is why we celebrate what we celebrate here. We went, again, from no Christians, no Bible, no church, no believers, to it being the official religion, and now, today, crosses all over Rome representing that one crucifixion. I want to read to you from the book of John. I love the book of John. It's a great book, written by John. <laughs> and it says this. It says, early on the first day of the week, this would be Sunday, following Sabbath, so again, on Sabbath, Jews didn't do anything. They didn't do any work. They didn't do anything. Early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, and the other scriptures tell us, a couple other ladies too, went to the tomb. Now, why did they go to the tomb? They went to the tomb because, the scripture also tells us, that a couple of them had seen Joe and Nick bury Jesus wrap them with linen, and do spices. And to be really honest, they probably said, they didn't do a very good job. Well, the sun was going down. They were rushed, etc., etc. But ladies, have you ever restacked the dishwasher after your husband loaded it? <laughs> Debbie does that all the time in my house. <laughs> ladies, have you ever uh, had to redress your kids after your husband dressed them for school? Well, that's what's happening here. The women said, we can do better than that. So they rushed down with more spices and linens. I don't know how they expected to move this one to two ton rock that was in front of the tomb, but they went. And so they went to the entrance and they saw that there was no, there was, he was not there. So then it says in verse 2 of chapter 20, it says, so she, and they, the women, so she came running to Simon Peter. They knew where they were hiding. The guys were hiding out now. They were afraid for their own lives, but they knew where they were hiding. And she knew where Simon Peter, and here's how, here's how John describes himself. If you haven't read the book of John recently, it says he describes himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> now, Jesus loved them all, but John in his own book says, I'm the one he really loved. I mean, I'm really special. I just think that's kind of fun. Anyway, and this is what she said to Peter and John. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. They didn't, she didn't come back and say, it's a miracle, he is risen. Didn't say that. Um, and the, the New Testament writers are really honest, too, because they, they, tell, they tell on themselves. If I was writing a novel about myself, I would probably make me look as good as possible. Wouldn't you? Yeah. Sure. But they're honest. They said, we didn't believe, we were afraid, we ran, those kinds of things. And so here, we get this honesty, too. Again, she says, she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have taken him. At that point, all of Jesus' followers were doubting Thomases. They were all doubting Thomases. Nobody expected no body. Get it? Nobody expected no body. No one expected a resurrection. No one expected a miracle. They expected Jesus to do what all dead people do, and that is to stay dead. In fact, in Luke, it tells us a little bit more of the story here. It says, but they, again, 
Peter and John, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Carrying on in John 20, though, so Peter and John said, well, okay, okay, you know, you're really upset, you're, I got it, we'll go check it out. It says, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. And I suspect that they started out walking. And I suspect they started thinking. And I suspect they got faster and faster. And, I, and then it says, they were both running. But the other, catch this, John puts this in. It's his, it's his book, right? He said, but they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. <laughs> For all eternity, I want to know, I want everybody to know, I was the winner of that race. But then he was honest and he said this, but he bent over, he looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. Why? It was a tomb. It was dark. He hadn't recharged his flashlight. They didn't have flashlights. It says in verse 6, says, but then Simon Peter came along behind him, and because he was Simon Peter, he went straight into the tomb. He saw, he, Peter, saw the stripes of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, by the way, it says that in the scripture, just want to let you know, also went inside. And then it says this, he saw and believed. Wow. Later that day, Scripture tells us that Jesus appeared to all of his disciples and they instantly re-engaged in the mission and the message of Jesus. And they all re-engaged not because of what Jesus had taught before, but because of what they saw. They saw the risen Jesus. And you need to understand that's powerful. It's not like, well, I believe this, I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to this. They saw Jesus. You see, Jesus had predicted his, birth, his, his death and his resurrection, and he pulled both of those off, but they didn't really remember that. He had said, I am the resurrection and the life, but they didn't really remember that. But the resurrection, his resurrection, caused all the dots to come together. It all made sense. It all made sense. It explains a lot of things, too. How Christianity, for example, made it out of the first century. With everybody disliking Christians and all the Jews and the Romans, how did it even exi it exist? It also explains why we have A.D. and B.C. B.C. before Christ, A.D. Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. I know there's a big movement now to turn it into, you know, B.C.E. and C.E. But even that is all based on an estimate of when Jesus was born, as is A.D. and B.C. This also has some practical application to you and to me. What happens here and what happened there? Basically, that story, which is not a Bible story, it's a historical event. But this story that I've told you basically intersects your life and my life and my story and your story, and it makes sense of all of this. It can make sense of all this. It can help answer the question, like, where do you stand with God? Where do you stand with God? How does God feel about you? How does God see you, your failure, your sin, your goof-ups? How does he see that? This story talks about that. And there's another verse in John, which I want to mention to you. It's a very popular verse in John. And it says this, John 3.16. And John wrote this as an old man, and he kind of went back and he said, this is really important for you to know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave. Whoever believes in him. To believe in him means to put your trust in him, to put your faith in him, to put the weight of your life in him. It's kind of like you have a big giant sway bridge across a river, and if you don't want to get to the other side, you've got to trust that bridge to get you there. Jesus is that bridge that will get you to heaven, that will get you to God. But Jesus didn't stop there. And some of you who are listening today online, hi online, those of you maybe who are visiting with us today just to kind of check us out. Some of you may have heard different kinds of messages from churches you've been in in the past, I don't know. And a lot of people have walked away from churches 
because it's like, I just, I just can't believe all of that. I just don't like how they make me feel in that church or, or whatever it might be. And so, again, John 3, 16, and I want to give you verse 17 as well. For God so loved the world, that means you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, Jesus, shall not perish but have everlasting life. For, the next verse starts with, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. If you don't take anything else away from today, take this. God loves you. And you might say, Pastor Jim, you have no idea what I've done. Nope. Don't have any idea what you've done, but I'm totally authoritative. I'll tell you, God loves you just like you are with all your wrinkles and mess-ups and screw-ups and everything. It doesn't matter. If you have to be perfect to come to God, none of us would be able to come to God. Christ died for you. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he was asked by all the Jews, Jewish leaders, what's the most important law to follow? And the Jews had over 600 laws, and Jesus, without hesitation, said this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. We've taken that down in our, in our church. If you haven't been to our church before, we've boiled that down to four words. And this is what we're about. Love God, love others. If that sounds interesting to you, that's what we do. Our church, a little brag on the church here, one of the reasons I'm a happy pastor, our church is the most joyful church I have ever been a part of. You walk in on Sunday mornings before the service, and after people have had seven or eight cups of coffee, <laughs> they're really bouncing off the walls. It's great. That and donuts, I mean, how can you miss with that? But it's a joyful place. And in the world today, I don't find a lot of joy in the world. There's joy in churches like ours. Probably other churches, too. If you're in another church, great. I'm not trying to talk you out of that. But we love God, and we love others. And this is why we're here today. This is the event that changed the world. This is why we celebrate Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you. Right now, Lord, I ask that you do that thing that your spirit does and speak to each of us where we are whether we have a relationship with you or we don't, and draw us a little bit closer. And for those, Father, who don't have a relationship with you, I pray they'll look up that 316 page we've created and follow that through and come to a relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for your presence with us. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for the free country in which we can come and meet like this in the open and proclaim Jesus as Lord. We pray this in his name. Amen.